In this talk, we will be covering the treatment of pediatric femoral shaft fractures, going over some basics of the numerous treatment options available um, in children and adolescents and the different considerations that we need to think about when deciding what treatment options we want to consider for a given patient. My name is Colleen Sabatini. I'm a professor of clinical orthopedic surgery at the University of California, San Francisco, Department of Orthopedic Surgery and work as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon at the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland. I also work with the UCSF Institute for Global Orthopedics and Traumatology. I have no financial disclosures relevant to this talk. One of the great things about pediatric orthopedics is the great variability of tools we have in our toolbox. And so with femur fractures, we do have a number of options depending on the age and size of the patient, ranging of course from a pavlic harness to a rigid um, intramedullary nail. With pediatric femoral shaft fractures, there are multiple factors that impact our treatment decision making. These include characteristics of the patient, such as their age, their weight, and the size of their intramedullary canal, the characteristics of the fracture, um, at what level of the femur it occurs, its fracture pattern, and significance of comminution. The characteristics of the injury, such as whether it was not it was an open fracture or if the patient is a polytrauma patient versus having just an isolated femoral shaft fracture. There are certainly regional and surgeon preferences that come into play. And there are patient and parent preferences that might impact our decision making, such as making a determination between using a spica cast or flexible nails in a child of around age four or five. Certainly, there are equipment limitations in some places uh, where you might not have all of these options available to you, depending on where you're practicing. And in places where families have to pay out of pocket for implants, certain things might be um, too expensive and so not an option for an individual patient. And not all the time do we have fluoroscopy available in the operating room, and that too can affect what um, your options are for treatment. So there is no one treatment method that is universally ideal, and it's very important to be familiar with the multitude of different options available if you're going to be caring for children and adolescents with femur fractures. Like all pediatric fractures, we have acceptable angulations that it's important to know. And so this would be an example table for femur fractures, noting, of course, that uh, the older we get, the less um, angulation we can accept. And in children, uh, remember that the femur does tend to overgrow in the setting of fracture. So um, in usually the first two years after fracture, there, if there is going to be overgrowth, we see it in that period of time. And overgrowth is usually around 0.9 centimeters, so about one centimeter total of overgrowth that can occur. Um, and there's really an unclear relationship between the type of fracture, uh, the location of the fracture, and whether or not overgrowth will occur. Um, so we tend to follow all children because we don't have good evidence to tell us who will overgrow and who won't. So given the multitude of options we have for treatment of femur shaft fractures, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons recognized that there was no established consensus on how to utilize these multiple treatment options. And so in 2009 convened a group of orthopedic surgeons to conduct a systematic review of the literature in which they reviewed 36 studies on pediatric femur fracture treatment and published these clinical practice guidelines. In total, there was 14 recommendations that were based on these three age groups. And of the 14 recommendations, only one had good evidence, uh, one had fair evidence, and unfortunately the other 12 had poor to no evidence. The one that had good evidence was that we should evaluate all patients under 36 months of age with a femur fracture for child abuse. And that's very important to remember and make sure we implement in our practices. And the other thing to note is that uh, they also concluded that piriformis or near piriformis entry rigid nailing is not a treatment option in um, children from any age up to skeletal maturity.
one of the main outcomes of this AAOS process was to acknowledge that the quality of scientific evidence needs to be improved in this area. There's a fair amount of controversy and lack of conclusive evidence with regard to the different treatment options for pediatric femur fractures. So a reminder to all of us around the world who are caring for children with femur fractures to try to do research to show outcomes and help us get better data to make decisions for the future um, with regard to femur fracture fixation in children. Age is really the most significant variable by which femur fracture treatment is stratified. So this table highlights the differences uh, that we have with regard to treatment options for children of different ages. For those under six months of age, really a, a small splint or a pavlik harness um, in careful movement and caring of the child is uh, important for pain control until some fracture callus can form in a the first few weeks after injury and give some stability to the leg. For children six months to two years, uh, in areas where spica cast supplies are available and the weather uh, makes a spica cast a viable option, uh, many children will be treated with spica casting. Uh, skin traction is also an option in this young population. As we get a little bit older into the two to five year range, in addition to spica casts and traction, Flexible nails and external fixation can become treatment options. And then for those five years to eight years, um, we see in areas where they are available, flexible nails and submuscular plates being used more commonly. And in areas where those are not available, traction and external fixation playing a major role. And then for children over eight years of age, um, we see the introduction of intermedullary rigid nails as an option since we are not concerned about the greater choke apophysis as much after age eight. So those become an option, particularly the lateral trochanteric entry nails. Um, we absolutely want to avoid piriformis fossa entry nails in this age group. So we have the lateral entry, rigid nails, uh, flexible nails, submuscular plates, and again, external fixation and traction. And then in the skeletally mature patient, if there is a rigid intermedullary nail available, then that can be utilized, or again, traction and external fixation remain options. Traction is a very common treatment option in many resource-limited areas around the world. In many cases, this is the primary and main source of treatment for children with femur fractures. And just to note, this is usually skin traction, so not skeletal traction, um, so nothing invasive through the bone. This can be longitudinal traction, 90-90 traction, Bryant's traction, uh, depending on the age of the child, the resources available, and the fracture type. Um, and then in some patients, it's not the uh, whole course of treatment in traction, but uh, skin traction can be used sometimes to temporize until a cast can be placed or surgical care rendered. A spica cast uh, can be placed under general anesthesia in an operating room or in a ER or procedure room under sedation. It's very important to make sure we have appropriate padding over the bony prominences, particularly the sacrum, to avoid any breakdown. And that cast liners have been shown to help decrease skin problems, but they can be quite expensive and not readily available in a lot of places. So making sure we take the time to explain to the family how to do proper diapering technique and avoid um, soiling of the skin is important. You can either use a, a single leg walking spica cast or a one and a half leg cast. Uh, both have been shown to be effective. It's important to note that regardless of your casting technique, you do want to mold laterally to prevent varus uh, at the fracture site over time. This is a picture of a walking spica cast, um, which again can be utilized. We do x-ray every week for usually the first three weeks until there's callus formation present to make sure that the fracture is not uh, becoming malaligned. And you can wedge the cast if malalignment occurs. 
the time in the cast is often determined by a simple calculation of adding the patient's age in years to three weeks. Um, and so if they're a two-year-old, then two years plus three weeks is five weeks total in the cast. If they're four years old, then four plus three weeks is seven weeks in the cast. But most children in the cast usually are sufficiently healed by eight weeks to have the cast removed. Remember that we can't uh, address rotational malalignment once the cast is on, so it's important to get rotational correction at the time of initial cast placement. And just an example of how wedging can be done to correct malalignment in the cast. For that uh, greater than two year old patient uh, for whom a spica cast is not desired or certainly in the over five year old um, patient population, elastic nails are quite common. These can be either titanium or stainless steel. We do use two nails of the same diameter to avoid malalignment from one nail being stronger than the other. We have a goal of 80% canal fill to try to maximize stability. These are most often inserted retrograde, particularly for mid-shaft fractures, but they can be inserted antegrade, just distal to the greater troch apophysis uh, laterally on the femur into the proximal piece, which can um, be beneficial for particularly proximal fractures to get control of that uh, proximal fragment. When we're done placing the nails uh, before closing, you really want to make sure you get the nails cut um, at the appropriate length so that they can be removed later, but that they're not so prominent uh, that they cause uh, soft tissue problems. And these are really best for transverse uh, or short oblique fractures. The advantages are that they do allow for early mobilization, usually without the need for any cast. They are um, quite cosmetic in terms of the small scars. They're a load sharing device. Uh, they avoid the physis and blood supply to the femoral head. We often see rapid union with these. And in surgeons who have some experience with the technique that can be done quite efficiently and expeditiously in the operating room. The disadvantages is that the femoral, uh, that the nail ends can irritate the soft tissue, uh, which can often prompt the nails to be removed later, although then they're quite easy to remove. Uh, they're not amenable to fixation for fixation of all fracture patterns, particularly very proximal or distal fractures or those that are comminuted. And we do tend to avoid them in children over 50 kilograms. The surgical technique for flexible nails involves positioning the patient supine on a regular radiolucent table. A fracture table is not usually necessary in these children. You want to mark out the level of the physis using fluoroscopy and then mark out the incisions. I tend to center my incisions on the physis or just a bit proximal. Uh, but then once you're through the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, you then move to the soft tissues proximal to the physis as you're going to insert the nail at an angle. Uh, so it's very important to avoid um, using any electrocautery or otherwise uh, damaging the soft tissues around the physis. Um, you'll enter the metaphyseal portion of the, of the femur about one to two centimeters proximal to the physis, and you can do this using either a drill or an awl. Um, if you're going to use a drill, you do not want to drill quite as far as what you see in this picture. Um, just uh, going to the midline of the femur is sufficient, uh, and then you will insert your pre-bent nails. We do tend to if you have fluoroscopy available, use that to determine what the length of the nail will be and contour in a gentle C shape um, for both the medial and the lateral nail. The nails are inserted to the level of the fracture site, then the fracture is reduced, the nails are passed, and then it's important to check the nail position to make sure that both nails are truly intermedullary in that proximal piece test the reduction and stability of your fracture fixation, and once you're happy to cut the nails. In terms of reduction technique, it's important just to remember that the proximal piece will often be flexed and externally rotated, and the distal fragment will be sagging um, posteriorly, and so I often will use a mallet on the proximal piece anteriorly to push it down and a stack of blue towels under the femur to elevate the shaft up to help with the reduction. And then the F tool can be utilized to control varus valgus malalignment.
We do use caution uh, in terms of flexible nails in children over 49 kilograms or over 11 years of age. And that's based on a couple of studies that showed increased complications. So that includes this study by uh, Dr. Weiss. And then this multi-center study uh, that was done that looked at 234 fractures and found that in children over 11 years of age, or for those who are over 49 kilos, uh, they were more likely to have an, a poor outcome with uh, the flexible nails. But there are other studies that have compared flexible nails to rigid nails and not shown necessarily that the flexible nails have a worse outcome, but, uh, but you have to use caution when using them. And if, a, uh, if you have a rigid nail available uh, that is a lateral trochanteric nail, then that's often the best way to go. And our next technique then is submuscular or bridge plating. This can be thought of as an internal fixator, useful for proximal and distal fractures or those that are very comminuted. Patients over 50 kilograms or those who have a narrow canal who can't uh, have a rigid nail because of the size of the canal. This is a technique that allows for less disruption to the healing biology than open plating techniques seen in adults. We do tend to use a 4.5 millimeter uh, low contact DCP plate that is quite long, usually about 12 to 16 holes. And just like an external fixator, um, again, this is an internal fixator. So we want distance between the screws with six cortices, uh, both above and below the fracture. We tend to not need locking plates and we actually want to avoid locking plates to avoid cold welding, which can make taking the plate out very difficult um, and only use a locking plate if there's a pathologic bone problem or very severe comminution. And you do want to contour the plate to fit the proximal and distal metaphyseal flares. Uh, for those not familiar with this technique, it is in, the plate is inserted distally um, at the level of the metaphysis and then slid up the lateral side of the femur submuscularly but above the level of the periosteum and then uh, once it, the pins are placed to stabilize the plate to the bone then the screws are placed via percutaneous technique again these are ideal for comminuted or length unstable fractures in children over 50 kilograms uh, for whom we can't use a rigid nail and good results in experienced hands but if you're new to this technique it could be a bit frustrating the first several times there is a risk of developing distal femoral valgus with these plates, the closer the plate is to the physis. So any child for whom the plate is less than 20, mil 20 millimeters away from the physis, you do want to try to remove that plate once the bone is healed to avoid distal femoral valgus. These can be difficult to remove and there is a risk of refracture once they are removed. So the advantages of submuscular plating is that you can get an anatomic reduction and early mobilization. The disadvantages is that uh, it's not a very cosmetic uh, incision because these multiple incisions um, are not very pretty. And then when you go to take the implant out, then you often end up connecting all of the incisions in order to get the plate removed. It is a stress shielding device, so there's a risk of secondary fracture and implant removal can be difficult. With lateral trochanteric nails, uh, these are used in diaphyseal fractures in children over the age of eight years up until skeletal maturity. They can be used in any fracture pattern and so, and they are particularly useful in length unstable. We know that we need to avoid piriformis fossa entry nails in skeletally immature patients because entering through the piriformis fossa or even reaming into the piriformis fossa at all can take out the blood supply to the femoral head and result in avascular necrosis of the femoral head in these patients. And so a standard piriformis technique should not be utilized in children. And instead, this lateral trochanteric entry um, is utilized. There are multiple companies now that make lateral trochanteric entry nails. They come in various diameters, various lengths, and with different proximal and distal fixation. So here's just a table of the different companies and different diameters. Note that some of them have quite a large open reamer size, and so uh, the size of the reamer sometimes is too big, um, even if the intermedullary canal is an appropriate size for the nail. Uh, you can end up reaming into the piriformis fossa if you're not careful and you have to avoid that in children.
So there's lots of studies that have looked at these three areas of insertion, whether it be a piriformis fossa, a tip of troch, or a lateral aspect of the greater troch. And if you enter in the lateral aspect of the greater troch, there is uh, no risk of AVN according to our available literature. In countries where surgical resources are limited and there is either not fluoroscopy or not other forms of implants or both of these problems, a sign nail is a wonderful option. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with sign, this is a network um, that was started by Dr. Lou Zirkel years ago to provide intermodulary options for resource limited areas to care for long bone fractures. And initially these implants were designed for adults, uh, but recognizing the significant burden of um, femur fractures in the pediatric population, a pediatric nail was developed. And the whole idea of these are that they are intermedullary devices that do not require fluoroscopy. And they are, um, uh, they are inserted using first hand reamers. So you don't need electric drills. Um, and because fluoroscopy is, um, not uh, an option, there's a jig for the proximal, um, interlock and the distal interlock screws are actually not necessary because of this uh, flare that was built into the nail distally to help um, have rotational control. The original nail you can see here in this picture and then the sign pediatric nail came out and originally it was just four millimeters in size um, in diameter to allow for bending uh, but then for the larger kids a six millimeter shaft nail was later developed. Um, and because that does not give great canal fill in an adolescent, um, the adolescents who have a large enough canal then use a standard um, fin nail. And this is a stainless steel uh, nail. And this is one study that was published a few years ago in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma by Dr. Shahab and Dr. Zirkel um, comparing the pediatric nail to the standard fin nail. Uh, looking at 18 patients that were all skeletally mature, comparing the, the pediatric nail to the fin nail, as I said. These were all hand reamed, no bone graft was used, and they did not have fluoroscopy for these cases. Each of them had the proximal uh, locking done, but again, there's no distal interlock in this nail. Um, the average age of this group was about 10 years, ranging from 6 to 13. Uh, 13 of the patients had the standard fin nail and five of them had the pediatric sign nail. Um, and the standard was used when the six millimeter PD nail was not big enough. So since many of these patients were adolescents, the fin nail was used. Of note, none of the patients were above 45 kilograms in this group. Um, they did have no infections. Their average time to weight bearing between the two nails was not significantly different. Um, seven weeks for the fin nail, which is the larger nail, and a little under eight and a half weeks for the pediatric sign nail. None of the patients required repeat surgery in the time that they were followed. None developed AVN or had a leg link discrepancy. Um, they did have 11 of 18 wish to have the nails removed at the patient's or family's request. The study is a small sample size and they um, had early follow-up and did not follow to skeletal maturity, but these results are promising. Uh, particularly when there's not other options other than traction available to these patients. And two case examples from that JOT study in 2015. This is a 10 year old girl who was treated with a standard fin nail. Um, and you can see the reduction with the nail and the healing over time. And this is a six-year-old boy um, who is treated with the pediatric nail um, with this somewhat length unstable comminuted um, proximal diaphyseal fracture with this butterfly component. And of course, external fixation is a very important tool in our toolbox. The advantages are, of course, that there are broad applications for external fixation Many places, external fixators are both available and affordable. For many surgeons, this is a very quick procedure because they're very familiar with external fixation techniques. 
Um, external fixation is much less invasive than open plating, so there's less blood loss and faster operative times. Um, and even in areas where there are other implants available, external fixators are an important component of damage control orthopedics in the setting of unstable, severely injured patients. The disadvantage of external fixation is um, pin site infections, uh, the potential for delayed unions and refracture after the external fixator is removed. You can get knee stiffness um, due to problems with the IT band and the quad, so range of motion of the knee is very important. Um, and then there's patient satisfaction issues just around pin care, cosmesis, and social stigma. Uh, but these do allow for faster mobilization than traction and uh, are a good option in places where there are not other resources available. So in terms of treatment of pediatric femur fractures, there's multiple treatment options. It's important to consider the patient factors, uh, the fracture characteristics, what fluoroscopy and, and equipment availability you have, and then your own personal preference and experience. Thank you.